there are things in my job that I do because I have to do them. Somebody's expecting it. If I don't do it, I'm going to be in trouble or someone's going to be disappointed. And then there are other things that even if you didn't pay me to do them, I would do them all day long. And the balance of that is so important for, for an individual person to articulate, to say in a given day, 80% of my time is stuff that if you didn't pay me for, I would do it. And 20% of it is just stuff that I have to do or vice versa, because that really can help you assess what is happening in your day-to-day -day that makes you feel good or overwhelmed. Welcome all to Cap and Gown Season 4, Episode 5. Today we are talking about uh, self-determination and motivation. I'm Rachel phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources, joined today by our president, Matt Boisvert. Hello. Hi, Rachel. Um, I'm at you today. Sorry, what did you say? I'm laughing, uh, you know, with you, not at you. But yeah, I have some, have some stories to tell. Um, but first, I want to say thank you guys so much for joining us, whether you're listening to us wherever you find your podcast or if you're following us on LinkedIn. Um, we always post lots of really great content, so don't miss out there. If you listen to us on YouTube, what are you supposed to do on YouTube? You follow us on YouTube, you like us on LinkedIn, or it's the other way around? Subscribe. I don't know. Subscribe. YouTube. Thank you, baby. <laughs> Subscribe on YouTube. Um, follow us on LinkedIn. I just need a script. I just need to remember it every time. <laughs> um, but we are so happy to be able to spend time with you. We were out last week in North Carolina um, visiting with um, a lot of schools on the college of uh, or on the campus of Salem College. Got to do some great presentations there and just be with practitioners and listen to what's going on with them. So that was really awesome. Um, one thing that was not so awesome, which I'm going to try to not go off on a tangent about, which is you could, you could you could go I off could, on a I could spend the entire podcast on this subject, but I'm not going to. Um, that is that I broke my computer. I drowned my computer last week on the way back while we were traveling. And so I have been without it it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. It's felt like a month. Um, I had to drive to Dallas to get it fixed and then they had to send it away and now they're sending it back to me. But Matt, it is such a good experience in the worst way. <laughs> Yeah, have to use another computer. It's like all of the little things about your password saved and like all of your programs are up to date, like Zoom on this this loaner computer that I was using is like the last version is a year old. It's going to take five hours to update this. Well, there goes my whole day. You know what I mean? So the keyboard is different on the loaner computer. It doesn't have any of my stuff. It's super frustrating. So it's a Windows machine, not a Mac. I mean, it's a it Windows Whatever. Look at the camera. I mean, the camera quality is way. Yeah. So I think when you work in the realm of technology like we do, it is just so helpful every once in a while to experience the frustration of like, I know exactly how to do this thing in seven minutes. And maybe it's not the most effective or efficient way, but I know how to do it versus this other way I have to learn that's going to take me 20 minutes to learn instead of just doing it the way I've always done it. So it's a very humbling experience and thank goodness I will have my computer back tomorrow. So that is very good news. Great news. Um, let's see, what else is going on? We're towards the end of October, which is incredible um, to consider. You guys remember that this is kind of reality crunch time for our students. They're like, oh gosh, I live here now in terms of being on your campus. Um, and so- a lot of schools just had homecoming and some uh, like we were talking with North Park are headed for fall break. Yeah. So at that point, yeah, it's just kind of October, a lot happens. Yeah. Um, all right, so you are in charge of our happiness words. Do you have one for us today? I do have a happiness word today. Awesome. Which I think we all need, but I think it, I think I it's do. relevant for uh, our conversation. Okay, so this comes from the book, Happiness Found in Translation from Tim Lomas. It's a glossary of joy from around the world, just different joyful words. And this word is, um, it is sati, and it's, um, I don't know what language this is. This is Pali, uh, sati, and it means the mindful awareness of the present. Ooh. 
business that is uninvested yet kindly and curious being in the moment, Sati. And I think we need to take some time to just be in the moment. I feel a little convicted about that. I don't spend much time in the moment these days. <laughs> I'm always like, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. So that's good. It's That is a good reminder for us to be very present um, in no, no matter what we're doing, especially as we're thinking about being with our students. Sure. All right, well, we have a great topic today. We're going to talk about drive and motivation, continuing this kind of arc that we have for the semester. You'll remember last time we were together, we had a great conversation with Dr. Sherry Woosley just about what's happening in the industry. It was a little cathartic I think, I heard from a lot of you that just it was a powerful conversation to have um, and to think through. So I'm excited to continue that line. But first, it's time for the State of the Union. All right, I have some interesting things for you today. First of all, just so you know, before we get into the meat of the articles, um, the FASFA regulations that we're gonna be ready in May and then we're gonna be ready this month, they're not gonna be ready till December. And actually now they're saying maybe they're not even gonna be ready until January 1st, which is the deadline, which I think is a funny way to say that because I thought the deadline was a couple months ago, but they just keep pressing yeah. it forward. But you guys, between FAFSA regulations and Title IX regulations that aren't coming out, I, I was at a seminar with some Title IX lawyers the other day, and they were like, we don't think it's coming out until December. So there's going to be a big shakeup of what's happening just in those two areas, not to mention uh, name, image, likeness, and the new admissions cr criteria that's coming from the Supreme Court. There's just like four gigantic things that we're kind of waiting to see yeah. how they're going to trickle so out so much is tied to the FAFSA, I mean. Yeah, so although I will tell you that there's a school, I think it's Assumption, yeah, Assumption U University in Massachusetts that was like, forget about the FAFSA, when you apply, we're just gonna look at your application, we're gonna tell you how much money you're gonna get. So they've like kind of taken that in-house because they're like, we can't wait yeah. until yeah. this stuff comes out in December. So I appreciate that, I think it's a good idea. Um, also, a couple of articles I have for you today about colleges resetting tuition. I think these are both worth the read. So we're going to pop it up on the screen there if you want to uh, do the QR code to be able to get to it. It's really interesting. There's this new kind of um, press for universities to right size their tuition, right? So to take out all of the like huge numbers and to actually tell the truth about what their uh, net tuition is without that discounted rate. What's really interesting is only a few dozen colleges and universities have done that over the past 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and so although tuition is actually only about 11% higher than it has been, because of discount rates, students are scared to apply because they're like, there's no way I could ever afford this. So there's a new trend in higher education to right side those differences um, and to help consumers really understand that you and I were talking about like, what does it cost? Like I'm applying and I get accepted and then I need to understand actually how much money do I need to come up with, right? I know I get on a soapbox about this, but the idea that you're going to spend for four or five years, unknown amount of money, um, and you have no idea how much it's going to increase from year to year. Yeah, like, for sure. It's just not transparent. And it's a, so it's a real problem. I love, so just in this article, several of our schools are mentioned as being a part of this effort. Well, so one really interesting thing is this tuition discount or reset, tuition reset is what they're calling it. First of all, it's really hard to know what it's going to do for your campus. So there are some schools that did a tuition reset. They had huge enrollment numbers in the next two years, and then those kind of dwindled away. They have other schools that did a tuition reset, and then all of a sudden they like consistently over five years had steady, not increases, but like an increase that, that they held. And so I think so much of it has to do with the school that you're in, you know, we talk about the retention equation, right? Well, who are the students who are coming? What is true about your institution? You were talking about even just the states, like what state you're in makes a huge difference. Yeah. I, so just talking with a school, for instance, where if you're in a state where a Pell eligible student can go to a state university for free, 
that's a huge that has a huge impact and might give you motivation to change your your tuition from the fifty sixty thousand dollar list price to actually be transparent and, and show a family how much it would be because when you start adding it up compared to uh, a state school it it isn't always more expensive to go for sure. So there's also the next article, actually, Matt, is the one that you're thinking about. And that is how to tell students about what it actually costs net tuition. So there is a new initiative that's called the College Cost Transparency Initiative that 400 schools, this, this initiative launched last week, and there are already 400 schools that have signed up for it. Um, and basically, they just are saying, listen, if you're a member of this initiative, number one, you're going to prominently display your net price. We have to all share the same definition of what net price is. That's the amount of money a student is going to pay after grants and scholarships. And they actually go through and give you 10 different things that if you want to be part of this initiative, you have to follow. Like, you've got to make sure that you're talking about What's aid? What's the source of the aid? What are the actionable steps to accept this aid? You've got to separate gift aid from loans and work study. Just we need to help students really understand clearly what they're signing up for. So our two schools that we serve, Houghton in New York and Washington and Jefferson in Pennsylvania have signed up for this. And I just think it's a huge um, help to students and their parents. And I actually think it means that students would apply to colleges that maybe they normally wouldn't because they understand what it actually is going to cost them, right? So I love that. All right, you'll remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this initiative in West Virginia that was paying for um, students to stay, like kind of a learning community, get work, uh, remote work, but stay in the state. And we're gonna help you with uh, some perks and kind of a community to, to surround. Well, this is happening in all sorts of different states. There's a great article um, today called Aging States to College Graduates Will Pay You to Stay. And this is about programs coming out of um, states like Vermont and Colorado who are like, hey, we want to attract, attract a younger workforce. And so we are going to help pay for your student loans if you will stay in our state for a little bit. So, for example, Vermont is paying students $2,500 a year um, up to $20,000 to pay off their student loans if they will stay in the state. You have at least 42 states who are doing this, um, who are doing like loan repayment or forgiveness programs since 2018, these have been around. So sometimes it's a specific profession, like you might have doctors or dentists or pharmacists who work for at least three years in underserved parts of Utah, they get up to $75,000 of their loans repaid. Wow. In Arkansas, Pathologists who work in the state crime lab can get up to $100,000 of their student loans forgiven. Like I said, this is coming out of Vermont, which is the third oldest state, like not longevity, but like population oldest state yeah. in the country. And their um, unemployment rate is 1.8%. So they're like, we have got to attract people who are going to stay in our state, younger people. What they hope is if they can keep you for a year or two years or three years, that then you'll make that just a long-term investment. So I bring that up as a way to say, if you are engaged with students, you need to know what the incentives are in your state so that you can be telling students in these professions or even in these particular states, here's how much of that you can get forgiven. I think it's really awesome. Yeah, that's great. All right. Um, you know, ACT is another big one that we're talking about. Uh, high schoolers graduating with the class of 2023 had an average ACT composite score of 19.5, which is 0.3 points um, below the average last year. So scores are declining. This is the sixth straight year average ACT scores have fallen. And Matt, I do a lot of reading about higher education. I've never heard of this before. I don't know if I missed it or maybe it's new and they're pretending like it's been around, but they're calling the class of 2023 the COVID cohort because those are the students that were in their first year of high school when the pandemic began. Yeah, so, so. yeah, so they have had, I mean, just the majority of their high school has been just in this upheaval and they're seeing much lower scores for that cohort of students. One more thing about the ACT, I think it's so strange that the number of test takers is increasing. 
So 1.3 million students in the class of 2023 took the class uh, took the ACT as a pair to compared to 1.35 million uh, 2022. So the number of students taking it is increasing, but the number of colleges and universities that are test optional continues to rise as well. Yeah, interesting. So yeah, it's a really strange thing. You were saying sometimes for scholarships that you have to be, take the ACT, some right? The, some of the top scholarships require that you submit your ACT or SAT scores. So yeah. that, that could be why, um, I don't know. It's really interesting. It is. I don't know. If, I want to know what the SAT numbers are. Are they dropping? Like, are more people moving to the hmm. ACT instead of the SAT? I don't know. Did you grow up taking the ACT or the SAT? I was a West Coast guy, so SAT. I was an East Coast girl, so SAT. I remember when I got to Texas and everyone was like, what was your ACT score? And I'm like, did I miss the thing I was supposed to have done? No. Right. Just different. No. Um, all right, I just have three more for you. The first one is about student financial wellness as a retention effort, which I think is really right. interesting. Um, this article is specifically calling out East Carolina University that has created a financial wellness hub where students can come and get one-to-one -one counseling. They can get coaching, obviously presentations. They have lots of Love different that. programming. It's awesome. I just think of like when I was in school, financial wellness was not a, nobody ever said that. Mostly you went to your financial aid counselor for them to tell you, here's how much money you can take out. Do you want it all? And you're like, yes, of course. And then now 20 years later, you have, you're still paying it back. Right. But there was no like, Hey, let's orient you to financial wellness, make good decisions. What should you be doing? I just think it's so important. And I'm thinking about a school who, during COVID with HERF money, raised their retention like 8% because all of their students didn't have to worry about paying for school. It's like, if you take out that piece of, can they pay for it? Do they have this financial wellness? They're, they're in a much better position to be able to be successful. So I think we just have to equip our students with that for sure. We learned a lot, yeah, during COVID, just working with schools and HERF and, and just hearing about different strategies and, you know, it was really interesting how for um, a high need student, a little bit of money went a lot long way, but for sure. is that the right way to say it? But then you had some families that, you know, their their EFC was was huge and and they wanted all the money. So, yeah, uh, yeah we learned a lot. Well, I like the idea of micro grants or even micro loans, right? Just to say, if we can just get you your books or we can just pay your traffic fine, or we can just, I mean, you remember Matt years ago when we were at Rochester College and they were talking about like, when you have a flat tire, the, because th those are cold winters and you get flat tires, right? Yeah. When you have a flat tire, the catastrophic effect of that on you being able to come to class, being able to do your work, all of that kind of stuff. And it's just such a small thing that you could stand in the gap on. So I love that financial wellness uh, perspective. I all hope right. to see that happen at more institutions. Yeah, I mean, sure. it really just makes sense. Um, there, There's a great article inside, in Inside Higher Ed today about three ways colleges teach first gen parents about higher ed. I think it's worth a read. What I would say here, and I've heard, this happens to me sometimes where I've like, I heard a thing and then all of a sudden I see it everywhere. And so the thing that I think is really interesting about this article is they are talking about how first generation students so often, because they are resilient, because they have grit, because they are like doing a thing that no one in their family has done before. Oftentimes they are a linchpin in their family. They are doing things like they have a job and so they're bringing in money, they're taking care of younger siblings, they're driving people places they need to go. Like they really are the glue to their family. And so you face the situation where the family is really happy for them to go to college because that's aspirational and they want them to be successful. And at the same time, their family is feeling a lot of um, sort of absence of them. And in some cases, but in some, in some cases, in unintentionally, but in some cases intentionally are like, can you please come back? You make our family run much better when you're here. And so this article is about how we bring families in 
make them part of the community, show them the campus and say, this is what your son or daughter is doing. It's going to be really incredible. They're talking about first generation orientation, how you have different resources for parents, just to acknowledge that a student both is dealing with their hardship of being on a campus with their belonging and all of that sort of thing. And then also, even if their parents are quiet about it, has this kind of pull back home because everybody needs them and they're such an important part of their family. So I think it's a really interesting perspective on not just acclimating them to the campus, but also acknowledging how important they are to their families back home. It would just make sense what your systems theory and, and how like you think about the, the role exactly as you said. And so how do, how do we leverage this um, on both sides so right. that we can bring the, the family in, but also encourage that student who's who's carrying all of that weight. Yeah, exactly. And there's something about, I mean, you know, just community, like just let's all come together and talk about that. I really love that. Yeah. All right. The last article I have for you, I'm particularly excited about because this is another school that we serve. It's Holland's University. Um, they have done something really remarkable. And I'm mentioning this not just because I love this school. They do so many awesome things. Um, you and I were talking about Tinker Day, which is where the president on some day, nobody knows when it is, cancels all the classes. Everybody puts on their hiking clothes and hikes up a mountain to the top and has a picnic of fried chicken with the president. And then they all come down and like everybody's super excited when it happens. They just, they're a remarkable school. They do a lot of really great things. This is about how they created a January term seminar specifically around resilience and um supporting learners who are affected by the pandemic, lockdowns, isolation, that sort of thing. So I bring this up not just because that's an amazing idea, but also because every time I am with our student success professionals, they are trying to solve the problem of what do we do about our students' mental health? Yeah, They're like, we can't find enough counselors and enough capacity to be able to serve the students in the way that they need. And so I love this idea of saying like, let's let's do something in a more scalable way yeah. that provides community for students to be able to talk to about this without having to go to one-on-one -on -one counseling. Okay, so three weeks, three days per week, three hours every day in January, they talked about um, healthy coping mechanisms, connecting with nature and establishing personal healing strategies. So they talked about things like yoga. They did forest bathing, which if I read a thing for a class and they're like, we're going to go forest bathing, I'd be like, yes, please. Just to be clear, that just means you're in the forest soaking it all in. Nature walks, meditation as a self-leadership practice. Uh, 27 participants. The outcome of that was that the students walked away feeling more in control of their fears, better able to process their emotions and more connected with their peers, which I really love. Um, and they're just saying there's strength in numbers. There are people in your community that you can leverage to provide these resources for your students. And then also it's really important to separate experiences from grades in a class like that. So this faculty member said any experience that we're doing is not going to be graded. We're not going to grade you on how well you do yoga or forest bathe, right? We will have things that you are graded on, but we want you to be really present like our happiness word in the moment when you're trying to learn these different strategies. So yeah. I love that. And I think it's a really great way to take care of our students' mental health. Anything it's, to add to that? No, it's, it's just really great. It's good yeah. thinking. Awesome. I mean, this is, a, this is definitely a, a problem for all of our schools. And so how do we batch solve uh, and, and going back to what we've talked about in the past with thinking upstream? Yeah, exactly. That is the State of the Union, which means that we can move on to motivation and drive. I will try to not be geeky in this episode because, you know, I like these kind of things. I like theory and I like language and I like thinking about um, different ways to organize our thought processes. So, again, just to remind you guys, this is coming out of Daniel Pink's book, Drive. Um, which is talking about motivation 2.0, which is about rewards and punishments. And he's proposing that we have motivation 3.0, which is really about intrinsic motivation and how we're pursuing things that we love. And this is coming out of something that's called the self-determination theory, which is, I think, a really interesting like change 
The self-determination theory came out of researchers saying like, I don't think it's so much about punishments and rewards. I think there are three things that people really need. We call them like the universal human needs. They are competence, autonomy, and relatedness, which you guys have heard me say before. And if we can give those to a person, you would be surprised at how motivated and how much drive they they show in order to engage in those things. And it's really different, Matt. You and I talked a couple of weeks ago just about the difference between like factory work, right, versus like this um, place that we are now, this environment where we're saying people want to do things that are meaningful to them and they want to have independence in how they do those things. And they want to be able to master and kind of go into this flow mentality where things are difficult and they have to really focus on them. So that's where all of this drive stuff comes. Um, I just think it's fascinating to think about universal human needs, right? Yeah. Okay. So today we are going to talk about the alphabet soup of uh, motivation and personality. The first one that I want to talk about, you guys are very familiar with, type A person versus a type B person. And I don't know about this one. I, I don't know. I'm kind of not happy to revisit this, honestly, because I don't think I'm a type A person. But then I read the definition and then I was like, oh, no, maybe I am. Which makes my nose itchy just thinking about it. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yes. Okay. You so, taught me something new about this today. Yeah. So Dr. Friedman in 1950 was like, I want to do research about the kind of person who is more susceptible to heart trouble. He's like a literal, like not a PhD doctor, but like a doctor, doctor. Okay. Okay. So he, he's a cardiologist. So he and his partner were like, we're going to do all of this research about what kind of person um, controlling for gender and ethnicity and job and all of that kind of stuff. What kind of person is more likely to have a cardiac difficulty? So they found that patients with a particularly compl a complex of personality traits, including excessive comp competition drive, aggressiveness, impatience, and a harrying sense of time urgency, were... Uh, more often to be engaged in chronic, ceaseless, and often fruitless struggle with themselves, with others, <clears throat> with circumstances, with time, and sometimes with life itself. And they were like, these are the kind of people who have more heart problems, which I don't, I really don't identify with a lot of those things, but I am often in a fruitless struggle with time. <laughs> I work pretty, I work pretty diligently at a time. Like, hey, we got things to do, you sure. know? So it's interesting because that's type A and then type B is just the opposite of that. But this idea of a type A personality became like very, very prevalent in society. And in fact, it got removed from this idea that it, would give, it was about heart problems and it just became a person who is super driven and like super motivated and, and kind of always in the struggle. So did you know about the heart thing? No, that's, that's what I learned today. I had no idea that it yeah. came from a cardiologist. Yeah. So, okay. So that's the first classification. And I think it's hard. I, I think it's helpful. You know me, I'm always like, how do we assess ourselves in this? I think it's helpful to know your orientation to life just in general. Um, and to think about how that changes the way that you approach work. Because I will say, let's see, how do we say this very carefully? There is something about the system of higher education that attracts a person who likes the system of higher education. And I think sometimes in the early years, the frenetic pace, the fact that, you know, when you're an RD, you're always on call, there's always something that you're always having to do a thing. I think for some kinds of people, that's really attractive. And there's the separation of like how I approach life anyway. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm going to approach life like that. And then there's the assessment of the structure of the job to say, is this set up so that even if I'm a type B person, I don't have a choice because the structure of the job is I am always on call. There is always something that I'm that I am struggling with. Does that make sense? It does. I, I wish you had read some of the traits of type B, you know, 
Well, I don't think they have. Okay, let me. See. You're gonna have to say a couple of words while I look. I don't think they have. I think they're just like. Okay, this is what it says. It just says, unlike their horn honking, foot tapping counterparts who suffer from hurry sickness, type B behaviors were rarely harried by life or made hostile by its demands. So it says they, they're just as ambitious, but they just wear it differently. They don't get irritated. They don't get infuriated. They just coast through. So. Those are some of my best friends are like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not like that. Yeah. Um, All right. Okay. So that was cool. So that's the first part is like, how do I naturally approach my work? And then what is the structure of work that maybe I'm a type B and this job is making me act like I'm type A and I don't really love that, right? That's the first right. thing that I think we can think about. Um, the next one is Dr. Uh, McGregor in 1957, who talked about type X's and type Y's because type A's and B's were already taken. Okay. So he's like, okay, we're just going to go for X's and Y's. And actually this is, um, we talked a little bit about this a couple of weeks ago. This really is coming out of factory culture, type X people. And I would like to say, I don't think type X people is the right, there is a there is an idea that people are type X. So I wouldn't say like, oh yeah, I'm a type X person. It's it's an idea that people operate in a type X manner, okay? So type X is people fundamentally dislike work. They will avoid, avoid it at all costs if they can. They do not like responsibility. In fact, they're afraid of it. They don't wanna have anything to do with it. They The most important thing for them in their jobs is security. They just want to know if they show up every day and do the thing that they're supposed to do, then they're going to be able to work there for 40 years. And they need direction. They can't come in and figure out what needs to be done. They need sort of this hierarchical boss who's going to tell them, do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then start again and do it over, right? So that is this type X. And we would talk about that in terms of like an like um, organization. So an organization that's very hierarchical, very top down. Um, you have supervisors who are always counting. I was thinking about the other day about in, in higher education, a supervisor who came to their success coaches and said, I want you to write down every minute what you do in this job. Right. And it's like, that is a type X perspective. You have to do that because you're not going to be working unless I'm keeping track of you. I'm going to have to either reward or punish you for what you're doing. This isn't important work. I just need you to show up and like, tell me, here's how I'm spending my time, right? You're making me itchy. I don't know. I know, me that. too. That's what I was going to say. It's giving me hives. I don't think, I don't think in general in higher education, we love this idea. Um, so then we move on to this other piece, which is uh, what type Y, which is people take interest in their work. If you give them interesting work, they're thrilled to be interested in their work. Creativity is almost everywhere. Even if you think about somebody who's not creative, if you give them a problem to solve, they can solve it in a creative way, maybe in a way that you would never even imagine because they're built differently than you. Their brain is going to think about a problem differently. And there's some joy in looking at a problem and saying, I know what to do. Now, you were the one who was telling me about the man who was running the um, business that then like went bankrupt and he was like, I have to buy this. Weren't you telling me that story? Yeah. Like, well, his name's Jack Stack. He wrote a book called The The Great Game of Business, I think is what it's called. But it's a story where he he um, saved a, a factory from closing that would have devastated this town. And so he he bought the factory, he got it. They they did um, refurbishing automotive parts. And but he knew in order to be successful, we have to change everything we're we're doing because the old way wasn't working, obviously. How do we get everybody involved? And and so Jack, um, I love Jack Stack. I mean, he's, he he came to Arizona State when I was there and talked about it. And, um, the, the great thing is just the empowerment. So yeah, creatively, like his whole thing was like, hey, we need to save money. We need we need to be more efficient. How do we do this? And he had line workers who had never been asked, never contributed ever, you know, to management. Um, 
who were like, well, the first thing I would do is paint the floor white because if oil drips on the floor and I slip on it and I, I go down, then that's going to take that machine out. So, right. And so productivity would fall. So they started painting the floor. They painted the floors white. And then yeah. everyone started having different solutions from their perspective. And he's like, let's go. And they went all in. It, it was really, it's a, it's a neat story that is about like, Hey, this a great example of factory work that can right. be creative where you can have your own autonomy and power and influence and become a master. All of those things. Pretty neat. Yeah. I love that. I, I do like it because it's related to factory work, right? Which is what, what you're saying. Like, we're just worker bees. We just come and do what we're supposed to do versus like, hey, how would you make this better? Well, I'll tell you five ways. Thanks for asking, right? So right. I love that. So what is really interesting is that so many times an organization would be like, oh, we're a total type Y organization. Like, we just give everybody autonomy and they can do whatever they want. And like, they get to master and under prop, you know, we, we let them take as many, uh, as much responsibility as they are interested in and then you dig in that a little deeper and that's what it feels like to administration but then when you talk to employees they're like no nobody lets me do it the way I want nobody listens to me nobody expands my horizons and gives me something to look forward to or to master and there's no language of this idea of connectedness underneath and yeah so I mean, we just we just heard this at, at a conference a room full of VPs of student development who were talking about I mean if you think about the weight, what's been added to their plate, the responsibilities, and like very little wiggle room in some of these things, like, right? So. Yeah, I mean, side note, I, we have a couple of side notes here, but I was thinking specifically around um, these big four things like uh, Title IX, ADA, uh, there's another one, we were just, VASPA, like all of this sort of, um, big regulatory pressure, which is oftentimes created for our bigger schools. And then you have one student success professional who now is in charge of Title IX and ADA compliance and like all of those different pieces. And they're just like, you've taken all the autonomy, all of the, all of the stuff that I love about this work. And now I'm just supposed to fill out the Cleary report and get it in. And the Cleary report is important. It's just a clear, like, you have to do this thing. There is no autonomy. There's no mastery. There's no connectedness in it. It's just a report that you have to fill out because it's important to do, right? So I think so, so many of our friends in higher ed are feeling that weight right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, I just want to mention that there's a great case study of this uh organization that's a type Y, which is Zappos. You remember this back in like 2000, I think 2008 is when they started, but their CEO, like they've written tons of books on him because he was awesome at creating these opportunities for his students to be autonomous, um, to have mastery and connectedness. So I just want to give you some examples of that. The first thing he did was autonomy. He was like 10% of your time is yours. Go work on a passion project. Like every Friday you get 10% of your time to just go do something that's really interesting to you. Because what we believe is that people who are creative and curious and learners, there's always going to be an application back to something that you're doing in your everyday work. So I love that. And when I talked to Sherry a couple of weeks ago, we were saying that is such a small ask. That is such a little thing that you can go to your boss and say, my team and I would like to have some passion project time. Or if you're a boss to say, hey, guys, find two hours on Friday and do something that you really are excited about. So I think it's a great example. Um, he also did a lot of relatedness work where he was like, everybody on the team has $50 to give to anybody else on the team that they see doing something awesome. So in that way, we're like, I recognize that you're an amazing team member, super fun. And also he changed from, he eliminated all of the bosses on his campus and he just put everybody in these circles of people who it's like, what? This is his company. Right. Yeah. Well, but I'm saying yeah. like where they worked on their campus and the yeah. company, he made them all into these little circles. And he's like, you guys are responsible for holding each other accountable for ethical behavior, productivity and enthusiasm for company culture and purpose. So like we're all bossing each other. We're all in this together in this sort of community piece, which I really love. And then the last one is he was um, uh, really good at mastery. He's like, you have to take a five week cor course to work here. 
over a year, we want you to do 200 hours of training and read like nine books. And we're all going to talk about them and discuss them because it's really important that you're able to say I'm a master at whatever I'm doing. So that's a great case study of just fun on the in the community. I love that piece. And so just thinking about higher ed and I'm I'm worried that there's been a lot of that has been taken out. I mean, all, all three of these components, but just with mastery, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's VP of student development. And he, he took for the first time, he took his team to NASPA and he said it, it changed everything Yeah, for them to go and be able to, to go to all the sessions and learn. Um, they had never been offered that opportunity before. And this is a way he's just talking about how they feel valued because yeah. they were able to do that. So investing in mastery just makes sense in higher ed, you know? Yeah, and I think it's something that, sorry, I'm taking a whole trip. I, I don't I don't know about you, Matt, when you worked at a university. I, I was so busy doing the work and I was sort of educationally qualified to do the work that I was doing that there wasn't a lot of emphasis for me on what is the vision and what else would you like to learn? right? It really was a lot of like, no, you're educationally qualified to do what you're doing. You just keep doing it instead of this feeling of like, but I'd like to learn something new. I There's this other thing that I am curious about and maybe could use in my work as well. So it's, it's weird because we talk about the coaching tree in higher education, right? Especially in the student success side where it's like you're an RA and then we've been doing this awesome um, exercise at all of our conferences where people are writing down the names of someone who inspired them on a block and then we're building this wall. And there's something so beautiful about being like that person taught that person who taught that person. Right. But I do think sometimes that comes at the expense of saying there's actually a path of leadership development and investing in making sure that we're having um, educational opportunities for for our people. Like it's not just we need mentorship, but we also need that educational piece as well. All right. Are you ready for our last alphabet soup? Yeah. Okay. So this one is coming directly out of drive. So he cited these other two, but coming out of drive, uh, Daniel Pink talks about type I people and type X people. So it's a little confusing because I've got two type X's, but just stick with me. Type X people are fueled by extrinsic desire. See what he did there? Extrinsic. Um, This is what we talk about when we talk about 2.0 motivation. It's really important to say like in extrinsically motivated people, deeper satisfaction is welcome. They're like, I would really like to be fulfilled. I would like to have some intrinsic drive uh, satisfied, but it is not the primary motivator. Like I am working for this extrinsic motivation. Um, You think about that in terms of like a job where you're making a lot of money you're not, you don't have autonomy. You're, it's not mastery. You don't feel connected, but you're like, Hey, for two years, I'm going to be extrinsically motivated and I'm going to make a lot of money so that then I can go do something that I love to do. Right. And if it happens that you have days where you feel like this was good work, then that's great. But that's extrinsically motivated. Okay. Okay. Intrinsically motivated, which is motivation 3.0 is fueled by intrinsic, sorry, I type I, type I, intrinsically motivated. Um, This obviously just says there are things in me that I want satisfied, like your autonomy and and those other elements we've talked about. What I love about both of these is that Daniel Pink says they are both born and made. So he says that he believes that most people are born intrinsically motivated and that some of us along the way learned extrinsic motivation is the way to go. So if you think to your childhood, the idea like these are things that I love and I want to pursue versus these are things that I get rewards for, right? So you can you can learn to be extrinsically motivated. And if you have learned, learned to be extrinsically motivated, you can also unlearn that and say, I want to try to pursue things that I like and that I want to do and see how that feels and then kind of make a determination there. So one is not better or worse. It's just that extrinsic motivation is a finite resource. 
so we talked a couple of weeks ago that if you blah, 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 then you will get blah, blah, blah is a weakening proposition. Like, like, like we said, you know, with your kids, it's like a dollar for every A and then it's $2 for every A and then it's $5 for every A because a dollar isn't going to cut it after a while. The nice thing about intrinsic motivation is that it's self-propelling because as you indulge in things that you're interested in, that you feel good at, that you feel independent in, you, you want to do more of that, right? It's like it builds. And so it's infinite. You're not going to run out of that. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, just think about, I have, well, there's just a whole lot to say about that. From the time we started going to school, we started learning about rewards, extrinsically motivated. And I mean, I think it's part of the wrestle right now with chat GPT is like, what's the use of this? How, how do we use this intrinsically to be for mastery, right? Versus to, to just throw out something that you have no idea what it actually says the computer wrote it for you and, and you turned it in that's yeah. that's just for that reward of a grade and um you get to spend your time doing something else right yeah matt we had i don't know where you were but at the office the other day i think we were all having lunch together i think you must have been traveling and we were just having a conversation about are we intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated or some of both or neither and we were talking about how in different scenarios you may feel differently Right. So thinking about your example is so good in school. I was very intrinsically motivated to learn. I love learning. I love new things. I want to know all the things about everything. I had zero motivation for grade. I couldn't care less. I don't know anything about grades. I don't even know how they assign them. Like I learned a bunch of stuff. I don't know what they're doing. Uh, assignments. I don't even know what that is. Right. So it's really interesting that in that case, I'm very intrinsically motivated for the actual good not this other thing. But then there are some things in our lives where we're like, I, the only reason that I get my inspection in my car done is because I don't want to get a ticket. That's the only reason I do that. Not because somehow I feel like a good citizen because I know that I'm driving like a, I don't even get it done. Clint, my husband does it for me, but you understand what I'm saying. There are scenarios in our life where we're just like, I'm doing that because that is a thing that I have to do. Right. Um, and I think in our jobs, it's so important to tease that apart, right? Like there are things in my job that I do because I have to do them. Somebody's expecting it. If I don't do it, I'm going to be in trouble or someone's going to be disappointed. And then there are other things that even if you didn't pay me to do them, I would do them all day long. And the balance of that is so important for, for an individual person to articulate, to say in a given day, 80% of my time is stuff that if you didn't pay me for, I would do it. And 20% of it is just stuff that I have to do or vice versa, because that really can help you assess what is happening in your day to day that makes you feel good or overwhelmed. And I just wonder, Rachel, what, what you think about how, how has that changed just in the last few years, as far as like, you know, being um, given extrinsic rewards and, and, losing, I think, some of the, the internal motivators. Yeah. Right? Well, let me tell you, I think the best way for it to assess this, I don't know if you guys have, have this, uh, this assessment. If you don't, I would recommend you get it. Let me. Okay. It's called, for those of you in our podcast, it's Noto Card Sort Career Values. This is, I think, one of the most powerful tools when I was working with students. But Matt, you know, we've done it with our employees. Um, we've done it before with employees who are like, I don't know, I'm thinking that I might go take this other job. I'm not sure what to do. And we're like, awesome, let's sit down and let's do a values card sort. And then let's talk about what that means for you. Right. So it is a really powerful tool. If you don't have it, please order it. I don't, I, I should get a royalty for that, but I, but I don't. The idea with the values card sort is that they give you 52 career values that you just go through and say, that's important to me. That's not important to me. That's important to me. That's sometimes important to me, but not often. So I do this with students all the time. Um, I was just in an accounting class and I did it. And it's so fun to see like the artic articulation of values because there are some of these values that will really resonate with you. In the class that I was just in, um, one of the gentlemen in there was like, my number one value is fun and humor in the workplace. And he's like, I would never have said that, but now that I look at it, I know it's true. Like, it's gonna help me assess where I wanna work. Is this a team that has fun together 
or do I walk in and it's like a funeral, right? Yeah. So I love this exercise in general. I can't recommend it highly enough. But I will tell you, Matt, today I did a values card sort of student success professionals pre-COVID. And it was things like work with a team, make an impact in your community, creativity, excitement, influence others for good, moral fulfillment, like all of those things I, I think are really rich. And I think a lot that would resonate with a lot of our listeners, right? Those are the reasons why we did this work. And then I did one that was just about what I thought, how those values I think had changed from COVID. And I have fast paced. So in COVID, fast paced and diversity, but working alone, practicality, challenging problems, working under pressure, steep learning curve, helping society. And I basically stripped out all of the work with team, work with community, you know, fun and humor in the workplace, like all of those kind of things I think got stripped out. And I think it's particularly hard in a job where you're extrinsically motivated by all of those first things, that when those intrinsic motivations get stripped out and we don't add extrinsic motivation, like I'm gonna pay you a bunch more money because you're doing this thing, or I'm gonna give you more benefits, or I'm gonna lighten your job load, or I'm gonna give you whatever the stuff is. When you strip both of those out, I think that's how we find ourselves in the place that we are now. And that's what Sherry Woosley is really talking about, right? Like th this is what they're finding is you sit in the room, at, you're actually, you're sitting alone and you're thinking, what, why am I here? Yeah. And, um, and so, I, you know, as, as we've made joy, our theme for this year, finding these, these ways to, to reclaim joy and how, how do we, how do we recover from what exactly what you just described? Yeah. What happened? to us. And unfortunately, some of these things that are just persisting, right? Yeah. So I think it's really helpful. I went through these career values. There are some of them that don't pertain. Like some of them, I'm like, yeah, that's not so much about mastery or competence or anything. But I want to give you some examples of things, career values that I think relate to this specific um, idea of our self-determination theory. And I want you to think about which ones resonate with you. And if there are some that resonate with you to think about how often do you get to engage in those things? And if the truth is that you don't get to engage in them, then the question becomes, how do we build these into our life, right? How do okay. we find the time and the place and the people to be able to engage in these? So if we think about this idea of being able um, to pursue competence, Think about working on the frontiers of knowledge, learning new things and new ideas. That would be related to competence. Challenging problems, engaging with complex questions, troubleshooting and problem solving as part of your job. Creativity in general, new ideas, programs, structures, anything not following a format developed by others. I love that one. Excitement, yeah. A high degree of stimulation or novelty in your job, which I think for a lot of student, student affairs professionals is important. Exercising competence, uh, demonstrating a high degree of proficiency. And then the last one is knowledge, engaging yourself in the pursuit of knowledge, truth, and understanding. So those are all competence values that if they resonate with you, you need to be able to point to places in your work and your job where you're doing those things, okay? All right, the next one is autonomy. So we think about independence, being able to determine the nature of my work without significant direction from others. We think about influencing people, being in a position to change attitudes or opinions of others, which I love with students, right? That's one of the best things where you get to kind of do these interventions where you're like, let's think about this in a creative way. Making decisions, having power to decide the course of actions or uh, policies, et cetera, making judgments in your job. So how are you autonomous in that way? And then the last one is time freedom, having responsibilities which you can work according to your time schedule. Um, so if those resonate with you, again, you want to be able to point a line to, here's how you can see that I'm engaging those. All right. And then the last one, and I think this is maybe the most powerful for um, people in the profession of higher education, and that is about our connectedness or our relatedness. So community. How do we engage with our community and become um, connected to them in that way? Friendships, developing close personal relationships with people as a result of a work activity, 
Fun and humor work in a setting where it's appropriate to joke and have fun. Group and team work with a group to obtain team results. Helping others, being related to helping people directly, helping society, helping contribute to the betterment of the world, and then working with others. How do we have close working relationships with a group and work as a team for common goals? So that would be another place where if you can say, I love working with the team, I love fun and humor, I love impacting society, and you know what, that's what I spend most of my time on my campus doing, then that's awesome. I think that's a great way to articulate a, a powerful position for you um, in your uh, work. Anything you want to add to that, sir? Well, if you would just show the, the deck of cards, so the Nodell career values Sorry, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. It's careernetwork.org is where you can get them. Careernetwork.org. Um, and I have 150 of them. Yeah, I have 150 of them because I do them with students all the time. I love them. All right, Matt. Um, I hope you guys, we are just in a place of trying to understand the sort of unrest that we are seeing with our colleagues. And I think over the last three cap and gowns, we've given you some really good assessments to try to articulate that, understand it, make subtle changes to that. Um, I, my challenge coming out of this is that we do have some control over what we're doing. And so finding ways for us to build in small intrinsic motivators to our day. If I read about autonomy and competence and connectedness and you're like, I don't do any of that. Like those things uh, are attractive to me. I don't, all I'm doing all day is this dumb thing that I don't wanna do. And I think we have to build small steps of how could you get some of that intrinsic motivation? Because like I said, it's not that our, that our um, institutions have found millions and millions of dollars to pay you guys back for the really important work that you did. We have to figure out a way to say, build your job so that you feel appreciated and feel like, I like this. I want to continue to do this, right? And I think some of the legs of that stool have been cut out over COVID. Matt, I was thinking, I didn't tell you this, but I, as I was doing this, I was thinking, you know, pre-COVID, Ferris used to go to lunch together, which we don't do so much anymore. We used to do Unsolved Mysteries every Friday, which we don't do so much together anymore. And I have a list of a couple of things that like made us really joyful and feel connected and feel like we had mastery that as I'm <laughs> as I'm preaching about going back, I mean, like we got to rebuild those things in. It's just you kind of forget like, oh, those were those things were so fun. We should do them again. Right. And it's like, yeah, it, it's like you were saying, it's not like um, back then we were wasting time Re right. really that that 10% of our week that we spent together was really valuable yeah. and I, I i appreciate feel a little convicted you pulling that out <laughs> but i can hear you know our our team is celebrating that idea like let's bring it back mm -hmm. um, what i was thinking about rachel is how even if you're you're at your institution and 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 you know senior leadership isn't on board with these things right now. They're not thinking about it. They have other things that they're working on. Being a leader doesn't require a position. The opportunity to uh, join with your coworkers and say, hey, we're just going to be intentional about forest bathing. Like, let's, let's all go for a hike together. Let, let's just get out. Or let's all um, master something new. Let's let's come up with something that we can do together and learn and talk about, right? Yeah. I just I, I think that there's an opportunity not just for waiting for the the board to say this is what we're going to do, but to say to your to your colleagues like we've had enough of <laughs> we've had enough of all of this um, getting stripped out. Let's bring it back, right? Yeah, and I think what you said is really important, and that is to recast that instead of, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to go. I mean, the reason we stopped doing Unsolved Mysteries is because I don't have time for that. Like, I, that's an hour where I have other work that I have to do, right? But if you recast that to say, I want to love this job forever, and that is a 
really fun part of our job and we should do that together. That's totally different than just saying like, oh yeah, that's just a dumb thing that we do and I don't have time for. So I think giving yourself and your team members permission to say, man, Wednesday, when we go to lunch together, that is really an important part of my week. And we need to build that in so that I can have longevity in this job and it can be sustainable and I can stop feeling like I'm just scrambling all the time. And then I'm actually investing in intrinsic things that are going to keep me motivated and keep me tied to, to the profession. So well said. All right. Well, thanks for joining me today. Um, yeah. And I think next time we're together, we're going to have a special guest, but I can't tell you about them. So you're just going to have to join us for that. Um, thank you guys so much for spending time with us. It is such an honor to be able to bring important issues to you and to talk through what's happening in our industry. So have a great day.